Good evening, everybody. Um, pleased to be asked to present on, on this project today. I, we, Borough Happold um, has actually supported two of the projects that we're talking about this evening, the Net Zero uh, Terrorist Community uh, Project and Community Heat as well. So I might be on um, standby to cover both of those. But today, um, I'm focused on the presentation of the terrorist home uh, community. I'm just trying to move a few things around on my screen. Sorry, I'm just... Uh, trying to get the slide mode sorted. So just to give a bit of background to this for those that uh, are, are completely new to what we're doing here, um, we have worked as part of a, a collaboration with a number of large number of parties, as you can see on the screen, um, to understand how to look at urban decarbonisation. Um, the particular challenge actually that we've identified and we've started to address is particularly around uh, terrorist home communities. Now, the key about this is there's a number of as aspects to consider here. There are nearly 10 million terrorist homes in the UK. Uh, a large portion of those homes, not all of them clearly, but a large portion of those homes were built at a certain area during the industrial um, age within the UK and therefore are very old buildings in themselves. Many of them, irrespective of whether they're new or old, are on small footprints as well. Um, in this case, you can see the picture of an actual community taken in, in Rosendale that we've been working with. And you can see the nature of the back of those homes um, and the space that there is in the yards. Now, what this means is that they can't actually take air source heat pumps into those homes to decarbonise the heat. So there's a technical barrier there. Um, current government subsidies at the moment are primarily focused on air source heat pumps. So if you and I as an average uh, consumer want to decarbonise our heat system, we're typically left with two choices. Uh, one is to uh, buy an air source heat pump, which is subsidised by the, the government, and you can get a payment towards that. Or the other is to buy an electric boiler, uh, which is very, very expensive to operate and run, but reasonably cheap to buy. Um, if you if you want an alternative choice, there really isn't one available to you. In these particular cases, uh, you can't actually store an air source, uh, install an air source heat pump anyway. You've got a space constraint physically, and you've also got noise aspects to take into account with the proximity to, to the residents. Um, you know, other, other items around this, which we'll talk about in, in a minute, is affordability, of course, as well. Many communities, therefore, can't afford a transition to, to low carbon heat. They haven't got access to more affordable and efficient technologies such as heat pumps and to go down the electric boiler route would push the bill up uh, quite considerably for the average household as well. Um, so we've been looking at that in terms of well what can we do to help these types of communities to decarbonize their heating. One of the things that we've been looking at and there are some uh, a number of projects looking at this around uh, the UK at the moment is community heat. So this is shared heating between homes, uh, ground source heating. And the advantages of this are multifold in that it's a it's an efficient way to actually um, use heat um, and share heat between buildings. Um, and also the ground source heat pump technologies um, are smaller, the, the ground the heat pumps themselves, and they can be installed inside the buildings. Um, and also some other aspects that um, as part of the business model of this is that as community heating, um, you can start to share the cost of that heating system as well. So the providers for this type of heat system, including Kenza, who we work with um, closely on the project, um, they will actually provide the infrastructure. They will install the infrastructure and then they recover the cost of that infrastructure over a typical sort of 30 year period through a standing charge. So from a CapEx point of view, um, there isn't that upfront capex to have to find from communities in the same level that you might have to in another solution. So there is a contribution in cost, but there is a, a business model um, that's got a financial backing to it as well in terms of supporting uh, measures to incorporate these heating systems um, on a community basis. But clearly, one of the challenges that goes with this is that you need the community engagement to get the buy into the system. Uh, the system only works if you get a certain uptake of people that are interested in it to make it commercially viable. So you're moving away from uh, single installations into a community installation. Uh, from a network point of view, in terms of considering, for example, the NWL's position, these systems are far more efficient as well. So they use a lot less energy 
they use less energy in a winter period than an air source heat pump in each and they use far less energy than a direct electric boiler would work. What we've done in this um, project as well is think about that shared heating system, but in conjunction with that, look at shared uh, energy as well, provision generation. So we've been looking at solar uh, PV, for example, but you could incorporate wind depending on the location. In this particular case, we looked at rooftop PV in this area. And the other aspect to consider is then affordability in terms of, well, can people afford to put solar PV on their roof and then use that energy? In many cases, that's not actually possible. But what you can do is establish a community energy system and you can provide that PV onto the rooftop, connect it together as effectively a virtual solar farm. And then you can sell that energy to consumers at a lower cost than they could otherwise buy in energy off the market. And it's a contribution to the annual bill because clearly heat loads in the winter and solar generation is in the summer. But even take into account that seasonality, the hot water utilisation can be off the solar and an annual contribution to the bill as well. So there's a there's an opportunity there to interlink that solar PV generation with the heat system. And there's also different funding models that can be explored as part of that and different ownership models between the heat system and a community energy company by providing that solar system. So we actually undertook the study on a particular community in Rosendale as a case study um, and it included direct engagement with the community as well. And we did some modeling. So Bureau Happle did some energy systems modeling, techno-economic modeling to show the viability. And we compared and contrasted a number of different types of scheme around solar PV um, installation, around different types of heat system as well. Uh, and the findings were pretty interesting in terms of the overall energy saving that could be made uh, by the homes with a slight uh, level of efficiency measures, a financing model that helped to pay for those efficiency measures, which made the installation of ground source heat pumps and shared heating possible, and then interconnected that with the renewable energy to get the price down. Also, we did an evaluation of the electrical load, combined aggregated electrical load onto the local network as well, and found that you know the actual overall load was significantly lower than the counterfactual of putting in electric boilers, which was expected. But in this particular case, you could deliver the scheme within the constraints of the existing transformers as well, um, which the alternative solutions would push the threshold above that and require local reinforcement of the electricity network to actually be able to, to deliver that. So there's a significant cost and time saving, not only just for the consumers, but also for the electricity network as well. Um, and then just to sort of finish really in terms of next steps and stages in terms of delivery as part of the project that we were involved with with the support from community energy south and working with valley heritage directly we set up rv energy so rv energy is now established as a community energy group within the area to look at how to deploy these solutions and engage directly with the community to deliver community energy systems we also um, had a retrofit study done by uh, people powered retrofit that in fact it evaluated a couple of the buildings in the area and actually showed there's good alignment between the cost model that we were working to and the level of retrofit that you might need in, in the, the buildings. Fabric is, is a consideration in all aspects of energy reduction and efficiency. What we're looking at here is the level and cost of, of fabric retrofit to enable the system to work and then quantifying those benefits. So you can push the dial, if you like, a bit harder and put more retrofit and more fabric intervention in to get lower energy costs but there is a sweet spot between the level of fun, uh, funding that you would need and where that's sourced from to pay for energy efficiency measures in the buildings and what you actually need to do to get a heat system and, and the pv system integrated as a smart system and actually technically work and be commercially viable so that's what we've been looking at and the initial uh, results look um, very very good actually in terms of that alignment at the moment and that that's it in a nutshell Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was really interesting. Um, there's been a few questions in the chat, which um, I think Robin Jones from Lancashire has managed to deal with. But uh, it was asked what this the COP, the coefficient of performance. I think he referred to it in your presentation. I'm not sure if everyone's had a chance to read the chat. I don't know if you can just give a quick, quick explanation as to what that is for everybody. So the, the coefficient of performance for the counterfactual, which is a, an electric boiler, is one. Um, and that's what we use as a base. For air source heat pumps, it varies, but typically you're using about an average of two and a half um, 
in cold spells that coefficient drops and then in, in warmer spells it works at say nearly three so we're looking at a relatively average of two and a half the ground source heat pump array is more stable in the cold period so you get a really good cop of around three pretty much all the way through the years so you get efficiency savings uh, a more stable heat offering as well as a result of that because you've got, you're using ground heat through that loop Thank you. I wanted to ask that question now, in case it was um, pertinent for the upcoming presentations. Liz, are we dealing with the other questions now, or are we saving them for afterwards? You're on mute. I can't hear what you say. Uh, I, normally, we save them for afterwards, but because um, Ollie hasn't appeared yet, I think we've got a little bit of time for a couple okay. of questions now. Uh, so then the next question is around engagement. How were the household householders all engaged on this? And are they owners and renters or, or a mixture, which I believe they are? And has everyone bought in to it? And I don't know, if, Phil, if you want to answer that, um, maybe Kate does. We've got uh, Rachel from Valley Heritage, I can see. Ah, or Rachel, if you want to join in. So Rachel, uh, you, you work with Valley, Her Valley Heritage, so you've done the engagement on this project, I believe. Uh, yes, we did. It, it was um, because it was only a feasibility study at this stage. We we did leaflet all the houses. We did a small amount of door knocking, um, but it was in the height of summer. So before the energy crisis really kind of, you know, went, went, went huge towards the back end of last year. So we had quite a few events and Liz came to one of them. And we, we had a, a handful of people um, turn up, to be quite honest, because it was summertime and it was nice. Um, uh, after that, we did have a few activities in different areas to try and raise awareness where we had, we were giving out free light bulbs and they got better attended as the, the weather got worse. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> so we did, we did that. And then we've had these two other, um, in, in depth surveys carried out of individual properties. And I think now that RV energy is established. Um, people have a point of contact to go. There's a website, there's information there. People know who we are, where we are. And I think it is generating a lot more interest. But we didn't want to go too deep initially because it was, it, you know, it is still a feasibility study. There was, we didn't know where it was going to lead, if anything was feasible. So, yeah, that's why we've not gone, gone deep with it at this stage. And it is, it's 120 houses. The mix is, um, I think there's 70% privately rented that area um there's only a handful that are owned by housing association and rented that through through them and then the rest are wow. privately owned are you able to talk about any of your next steps that you've got for the project uh, i have to say i think kate might be better to deal with that because she's been more involved in rv energy than i have uh, yeah 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 sure thanks rachel um Yes, so we did apply for excuse me, more funding mm. through the Pioneer Places Fund. Um, so that is um, starting at the beginning of March. Um, and that's going to be looking at, again, Bill Hoppold are, are working on that one. This is looking at non technical barriers. But we also got some funding for um, an app which has been developed by the Centre for Energy Quality, and that app's called the Fair Awards app. So in a couple of weeks, we're going to start piloting the app um, and we're going to trial that with uh, ideally get 50 people just to use the app and see what they think. And then 10 people to do a much more detailed interrogation of the app and their feedback. Um, and that app has been designed in really to engage people, because if we're looking at you know, 150 houses, obviously doing door knocking, surveying, it's really labour intensive. So if we can do groundwork via an app, um, and the incentive is that people can get energy efficiency tips, they can understand whether they're eligible for grants, etc. Um, so we're just about to start trialing that. And I think that's quite exciting, really, because it means that you whereas the local authority starts with a static data set, um, an app means that the local authority has kind of a two-way interface with people in the community. So even if you just start off by asking fairly basic questions of GDPR tick, or do you want more information? Yes. Um, you know, information about how much your energy spend is, how many people live in the house, uh, your household spend, are you going to be eligible for, for grants? But then at a later stage, you can go back and say, we're going to be doing community scale low carbon heat in your area, or we're going to be doing retrofit. 
So it means that you've got that connection with, with people in an area. So I think that's that's quite exciting. Um, we've Phil, do you want to just say something about what the Pioneer Place Fund is doing, um, the grant funding from Borough Huffle? Yeah, I mean, we, we've done the techno-economic evaluation to show that the scheme's viable from that perspective, but clearly there's a lot more aspects to that, building on what Kate's just described as well, but really around the business model and the stakeholder engagement model that goes with that as well. Because, for example, the operating model, or one option for the operating model is that you have a community energy company that runs and manages the solar PV. You have a, a utility company, an ESCO, that provides the heat system. Um, and then you have integration with EMWL as a, a DSO going forward to look at flexibility provision from that system as well and an interface there. And you have various different funding options to make that work as well as revenue streams to make it work as well. And while we've done an initial structure for that business model, we want to really go into it to A, finesse it and be to look at the, some of the regulatory and policy aspects around that as well because there are some innovative um, aspects there are platform providers out there you know digital integration companies that will knit that together and make it work once you've once you've got it sort of designed but the operating model the stakeholders and the financing structures they really need to be developed a bit further than they are at the moment and that's what we'll be doing in in april going forward Thank you very much. So there's a few more um, technical questions in the chat, but we'll come back to the, the to them at the end because there might be some other ones from the other presentations as well. Uh, so I think for now we'll move on to uh, Paul Smith, who's working with Shipping Community Energy, so they can talk about their um, um, heat project. So over to you, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, before I kick off, um, I'd like to just say thank you for the question about the COP. I think there are far too many TLAs that we do use. Yes, please yeah. do feel free to carry on calling TLA, them. TLA, of course, <laughs> is a three-letter abbreviation. Um, um, in chipping, we uh, have been asked uh, if we would like to look into community energy. And perhaps to understand a little bit of the reason why we were asked, we have to have uh, a little bit of history. Um, the chipping is a very much a, a, at its core is a, uh, a stone built village um, that's almost reminiscent of the Cotswolds, but up in Lancashire. We do have other housing as well, and I'll take you through all the, uh, the bits and pieces that we get to. But let's say a little bit of history. Charles III is now on the throne. We used to have Queen Elizabeth II, the second, uh, Sir Prince Charles in the uh, in Chipping Village Hall from the earlier presentation. But let's let's go back a little bit further in history if we can. Let's go back from from uh, Elizabeth II to Elizabeth I in the 1600s. And we'll move quickly through the antidote to uh, Nicholas Sturgeon, James I, who was James VI of Scotland, and on to Charles's uh, princess, Charles I, who lost his head to uh, Oliver Cromwell. And we get through then, um, we're without a monarchy for 11 years in, in, uh, in England um, until Charles II came along. And he was restored to his throne. There you can see him sitting on his throne. Now, the 1660s an interesting time. In 1665, we had the Great Plague of London. A year later, we had the Great Fire of London. And of course, in 1668, John Brabin, gentleman of Chipping, who was also a cloth merchant and dyer, opened a shop in Chipping. That shop is actually has been continuously trading since 1668 and is now believed to be the oldest continuously trading shop in Britain. When John Brabin died in 1683, under his will, the following year, we set up the Brabins, uh, uh, the Brabins Trust was set up, and it basically had two charities, one to look after the educational needs of the village, and the other one to um, try and alleviate hardship. It was the almshouses charity. And one of the things that we were looking to do um, as times moved into the 20th century was to try and alleviate, there wasn't really poverty about it at the time, but trying to alleviate those conditions of hardship. We were conscious that many people were leaving the village and going elsewhere. And so we started to look into affordable housing before affordable housing became popular. And this is about 20, 25 years ago. And we were selected as, uh, Village Tripping was selected as one of seven rural community land trust uh, projects, CLT, there's another TLA for you. 
uh, in England, and we we own now 11 units of affordable housing in the village. But we but the Community Land Trust was set up with a much wider remit than we got with the Brabins Trust. Um, sadly, unless you can read into the uh, the community benefits which are lifted out there, community energy, that was a little bit outside it. it hadn't really been considered. So they they decided when. Lancashire County Council approached Ribble Valley Borough Council, our local borough council, which village to go to, they said, go to Chipping. We're a village, we've got about 300 homes, we're off the, grass, the gas grid, we've got many outlying hamlets and farms, we're a village that's rich with two pubs, used to be three, three churches, a couple of primary schools, a couple of shops, we have an annual agricultural show. Uh, when we built the village hall, um, oh, 25 years ago, near enough now, uh, we raised money by having a, setting up a, a, a steam fair, which is now run annually, that produces money. The village hall cost about 400,000. We then spent a quarter of a million pounds uh, on the playing fields and, and, and so on, and water games area. And the latest thing that's been amusing us has been Barn, which is the broadband for the rural north. And it's hopefully is allowing uh, people up in the north not to be left behind when the telecoms operators refuse to put cabling anywhere near. So we're doing it ourselves. As volunteers, we're getting broadband delivered around here. So what are we doing? Um, well, you all know, I'm certain sure it doesn't need me to tell you why we need to get off uh, oil and LPG. Um, and uh, we were set up as a working group by the parish council. We applied for funds from the Rural Community Energy Fund, the RCEF, uh, to try and find some solutions. And I've put a link there. If, are these shares, these um, slides then going to be shared later? Yes, they are, good. Uh, there's, there's a link uh, there to our own uh, page. Um, so we got our first grant from the RCEF and the consultants that we used decided that the scheme that we ought to go for was one that was largely based on what they'd done at Swaffham Prior, which is in Cambridgeshire. And there they, they sunk a number of boreholes uh, in the village and they would pipe round about 75 degree heat, having extracted heat out of the ground, it went to a centralized power plant and boosted the temperature, then they got insulated uh, heat pipes uh, go, going throughout their village. But whilst it's a good solution, it wasn't suitable for Chippy. And it wasn't suitable really because to put the number of boreholes that we needed, we'd probably need about 25 acres of land. Now in the top right, you've got a, an aerial um, a picture of what chipping looks like. You can see it's, it's a whole section of spindles coming out. I'm trying to find 25 acres right next to the village when people are thinking now if chipping ever, ever expands they'll be wanting to build on my bit of land they're not that keen on actually having boreholes down and being selling that bit of land at a cultural value so that was a difficulty we're in an area of outstanding natural beauty so hiding a centralized power plant somewhere it's not like it's a flat temperature bit that you can plant a few trees and it's all screen you see it we're lumpy up here you see it from other hills. We're also a bit concerned that because we're so spindly, we'd probably have lost a little bit of heat. So, good solution, but not applicable to here. So, we applied again to the Rural Community Energy for a further grant, which we were given, and we retendered. And it's really, really good to get some um, solution focused consultants now on board. And We've engaged for the community. We've got registered interest now from a number of residents in the village, carried out energy audits with a, uh, with a, a specialist energy consultant on 22 homes, uh, the village shop, and also one of the schools. And what we're doing is we're looking at micro clusters based on a low ambient heat network. Last month, I can now say last month in, in January, only a couple of weeks ago, we had a trial of boreholes was put down, um, and uh, that is now waiting to be uh, to be heat tested so that they can assess the suitability of the local uh, geology for ground source heating. We've looked at other.
projects, we've looked at, uh, as I say, uh, Swaffham Prior, Cambridgeshire, we've looked at Scythians down in Cornwall as well, which is a remarkably similar uh, scheme here. And, and like Rossendale, they've got cancer involved. Uh, the, the big difference, I think, with Scythians and us is that their borehole is <laughs> absolutely pristine, ours is a sea of mud. Uh, but that's, a, that's another one. Um, we've also have looked at the, the Rossendale scheme as well, which uh, you just heard from. So the next steps for chipping, um, we will be uh, now uh, looking at uh, the uh, analysing the energy surveys and uh, just find my bit here. And based on the information gained from the energy survey, surveys and the borehole analysis, the design engineers will then develop computer models for representative house archetypes in the village. And as you can see from the, the, the slide at the bottom, we've got a number of different uh, housing stock in the village, not just all twee uh, stone houses. So these computer models will then inform the conceptual design of the heat pump based energy system for those house archetypes, uh, archetypes, which together with the homes where the residents have registered their interest, will provide key information to the team on the requirements of the proposed energy system. And we're also uh, able to better understand those areas of the village that would be most suitable for the development of localized share, shared cluster heat networks. Um, they will also assess the effectiveness of, of how the uh, low temperature system will work in the, in the village. And it may be that not all of the properties that we that we look at would be suitable for it. But this will this will we will find out and it will shape the project as we as we go along. Doesn't need me to tell you that community action uh, to get localized energy solutions is probably the cheapest, fastest, and more effective way to do it. But most importantly, for, as far as we're concerned, it means that people won't get left behind. And the People that you saw on the grassy bank on the first slide are, well, some are, some are, are keen and informed community members, and it says up on the screen. And, but they're basically trusted people who can then take the message back into the community and spread that. So we will also then be looking at um, getting a greater understanding within the community through community website that we've got, uh, other ongoing activities, the energy surveys, feedback process, drop-in sessions and similar, all helping the community shape the project as it develops. But community support is key to the project's ultimate success. Not only does it allow us to better understand where the greatest interest is within the village for the localised ambient networks, but community support will also help us promote the project more widely to the key stakeholders. The project is targeting, targeting an application to the Green Heat Network Fund, which is looking for innovative projects that will demonstrate the capacity to achieve significant carbon reductions. Therefore, the more homes that register their interest, the better the prospects that we've got of securing capital grant funding for future community heat networks. And here we've, we're working alongside a, a group just up the road at Cotton Vale, who are working to satellite with shipping. They've got funding separately through the DNO, District Network Operator. Um, and it may well be if we want further numbers, we'll be able to include Cotton Vale within an application uh, that we'll be doing. So having developed the conceptual design for the system, the team then can determine what consents will be required for the scheme and start engaging with key stakeholders and third parties as part of the process of securing those consents. This could include the planning uh, consents, an agreement with the highways authority to lay pipes in the public highway, because the last thing we want to do is to be digging up a bit of road and then have to stop and wait for the notice to be served to be able to go and dig the next pick up. We want a working method of being able to do it for the highways. Um, similarly, uh, we also need to engage with the local grid contractor to better understand uh, the extent 
to which there are any grid uh, constraints that will impact on the proposed system because many areas are weak in terms of the electricity grid uh, and this is important not just for heat but also for transport and electric cars and it may be that localized energy solutions come about in other ways with solar pv wind turbines hydroelectricity and we in chipping we're looking at possibly seeing if we can get a, a solar pv array um, to be able to bolster up the electricity network to be able to get help with all these heat pumps and then the bit that really sort of floats my boat if you like the governments and the finance um, it's difficult to try and get an exact handle on on what we're doing until we everything else falls into place but the the structure that we're going to use we don't know it might be that we take the community land trust and we we morph it in some way we may set up a separate uh special purpose vehicle uh, in order to do it we might sell shares to be able to help raise money the financing and grant availability of course is is very very important and it's not just financing the underground boreholes and pipe network but also the costs that the residents might otherwise have on heat pumps insulation and retrofit because if that cost isn't covered it would certainly mean that those who are less well off in the community might not be able to come with us on this journey we've then got to be looking at the contract with the residents and you've got to remember that somewhere in every village there is a mrs miggins whose children have been have gone to the local school uh, and uh, if she suddenly falls into arrears which one of us is going to go around knocking on her door and asking for the money so we've got to think in terms of, of what we've got to do there but above all we want to make sure that what we do is an, is acts as an exemplar and is fully re replicable certainly in terms of the technicals we believe that going for a cluster small clusters where you've got one or two boreholes linking maybe you know one two three four houses is probably a, a replicable bit because it can be replicated not just within the village a number of times but also in the small outlying hamlets which is important so we're, we're looking then for the um for things to be replicable with the legal agreements and how to create uh, those and, and, and finally really now that the rural community energy fund has finished we do need more policy support and funding for rural communities so that we can get over the problem of the, of the weak grid that we've got and it might be that we can take a leaf out of barnes book with rural broadband rural communities again were left behind and it might be that we can come up with a similar mechanism for low carbon heat rollout with barn we've had a the rural gigabit voucher and perhaps we should be looking at a rural gigawatt scheme to be able to go forward to be able to help provide funding for community scale area energy plans and i'll just read that last little bit out it says the rural transition poses big unknowns for those invested in the net zero transition and policy and funding support we needed to gather evidence and provide real world examples of the cost effective and timely solutions so that's us uh, as it says at the end is this the end or is this the beginning we don't know we shall find out um and i've also just included um after that another couple of slides with a load of links i, I say i've done it um kate's actually provided uh, those and so when the slides come out you'll have got a lot of links in there to to various other bits of useful that's me done. thank you very much that was a, a, an excellent way of stepping us through everything that you've achieved to date i think uh, you're very much at the beginning but you've or at the end of the beginning <laughs> because you've done an awful lot to date and uh, yeah it was great and you gave us a real sense of where chipping is and what it's like so thank you very much for that um so I think now we'll move on to our third and final presentation. Uh, I believe Ollie is here with us, who's going, and Ollie's going to talk about the Community Heat Project, which is looking at a village in the south we southeast uh, called Barkham. So um, over to you, Ollie, to introduce us to your uh, project and your approach. Thanks, Helen. 
And thanks, um, Paul and team. It's amazing what you've been doing in chipping, and yeah, I'm excited to follow on. But um, and I, so I've sorry, I've literally just driven in, so we'll have enough time to make a cup of tea. So I just need to um, stop the other screen sharing and bring up my presentation. And hopefully, Liz, you can see that. Can you? Hello, Liz. By the way. Is it on full screen yet? Yeah, great. Paul, can you see it? Yeah, it's working now on full great. screen. Go for it. Okay, jolly good. Right, so, um, well, hi, good evening, everybody, and lovely to see you all here. So, yeah, um, this program um, is originally called Community Heat, but we've rebadged it as Community Power. Um, we're, we're, we're playing with names at the moment, but... So bear with me and um, for any of you secret police on slides and things like that, don't point it out. <laughs> but um, basically, um, this is the Community Heat programme, and I'll go through it, was developed um, through a village where, where I live and um, where in 2011 we did a local energy plan um, and actually at that time with the Centre for Sustainable Energy. And uh, we did loads. We did a community energy plan. We did a home energy assessments and, e you know, EPCs. And we just got the village engaged. And it, it had followed on from a local plan um, when the village in their local plan in 2009, it was unanimous that people wanted to find a way to come off oil. And um, so this got us thinking a lot and the years went on and the oil prices dropped and went up and you know the feeding tariff changed and all all the highs and lows of the energy market that we're all involved with and then um in 2018-2019 I started working with Borough Happold and more of a regional energy strategy where we were looking at um you know how the region could move on to net zero and everything and we got talking about this project again. And I, I said to Boa Happold, you know, the thing in my mind was, what if we were, this community was so well engaged and everybody came off oil, 80% of the village use oil, what would happen to the grid? And we thought that was a really good thing to explore. So we went up to the Energy Networks Association up in London, where all the DNOs were and Helen's colleagues were there from Energy Northwest and MPG and SSEN, you know, they're all there. And we presented the idea of developing a decarbonisation plan for a village that would allow, give everybody in the village uh, a plan for decarbonising, coming off oil. And um, so we went on this journey with Community and Borough Happel brought in lots of experts, built digital twins of the village. And here are some of the um, findings that we got. And um, it says, why is my presentation moving on? Ah, no, it's not moving on, multi presentation. Ah, yeah, it is. So, and basically um, this project was funded through the Network Innovation Allowance, which is a DNO fund for looking at innovation. And um, so we had a planned approach and an unplanned approach to decarbonisation. And, um, and these are some of the findings that we came and the cost benefits for, for community energy um, and technology benefits for, for community energy and how, and the electricity system as well. So, and one of the highlights was this, the, the electricity network, given a planned approach to decarbonisation in a rural community, could make up 75% savings on their network reinforcement costs. So, you know, it was a it was a large, large project. And in total, I think Phil will probably um, correct me, but I think we've got 12 million data spots for this village. Um, so, and Borough Happold have built digital twins. So it's based on the fact that 80% of the village were on oil, we could install 500 heat pumps. Um, there's EV charging in the background as well, allowing for the amount of, um, of the community that would up 
grade through a heat pump by 2025 and 2030. Um, the energy savings by the interaction of having a local energy champion supporting the village and, um, and, and so on, but also a network of small scale community solar projects around the village. And because as we started to assess the LB system within the village, we realized that there were small substations within the village that could connect renewables um, that had capacity. And this is an area that is quite highly constrained by capacity at this stage. So, so that was another you know, vision that we had is that we can build small scale renewables, 200, 400 kilowatts, but multiple systems around the village to feed into the village and ultimately to bring the cost of electricity down for everybody. I should say that over the last 10 years in this target village, we've done three heat network assessments and actually none of them really stacked up because of the complexities of not having a, an anchor point, but also um, you know, all the services in the ground and all the groundworks that would need to be done. So, and, and then different full highs and lows of the energy market. So, um, but anyway, this brought it all together. <clears throat> so then we, we developed with um, Ofchem uh, uh, and with the with UK Power Networks and Borough Happold and another organization called the EA Technology, who are kind of old school innovation organization that kind of work with the DNOs and the electric market. And we developed um, community power and took it through the network network innovation competition. I think it's important to say, and that that is a very detailed six month process where we built the business plan for um, piloting the Barkham project. So taking it, building the renewables, and really piloting, but also scaling up to other clusters. And I'll explain about the clusters in a minute. Um, so, so we, we split the project into two elements. Method one is community decarbonisation. So where we, we look at transition from fossil fuels, you know, the, the first, you know, the first question. And, um, and also looking at a digital twin and how um, community energy could integrate with the project. I mean, and drive the cost of electricity down. And then method two, um, was around um, sort of community balancing and trialing balancing. So how that we could look at flexibility markets, um, community generation, but also flexibility, you know, um, time of use tariffs and things like that, and a local supply option. So balancing options. So it's the whole package, if you like, the whole system. Um, so anyway, we are where we are. But one thing that has come very clear from this process, and I'll explain that, is about the process that we went through, um, looking at house by house in a community, let's say of 800 homes, a parish in 800 homes, is that we created a local marketplace. And that, that sort of raised the ears, like in the eyes of the district councils and the local authorities, who said, hold on, we're interested in this whole net zero journey it, it aligns with our net zero ambitions but also um it's you know we we need to look at the able to pay market solutions in rural communities we need to find low fi carbon you know low finance solutions for retrofits um we need to embed energy champions in those communities but also skill up the supply chain and a lot of that is developed through our community power research really and so we're starting to look at a clustered approach to community power and how we can start empowering market towns market town community energy groups to engage wider with their parishes and in doing so develop sort of small-scale community power programs with all their parishes and in doing so creating a local market of say two and a half 3,000 homes, and then engaging the supply chain, looking at um, investment models with the local authority, and, you know, scaling up this kind of approach, and preparing rural communities 
to get to net zero. Um, so this is slightly different from the heat networks approach, but it's more, you know, a house by house and, and supply chain work and embedding communities. Now, um, this is an example in Essex that we, Essex County Council asked us to run. So in Essex, there are four community energy groups um, that actually Community Energy South have been supporting. Um, and so we've started to look at what their clusters look like for those community energy groups. So they could deliver this program with engagement, learn what we've learned from Barkham and kind of speed up. Um, and then taking that a little bit further, we've engaged across the Southeast at all sorts of clusters across all the different authorities. Um, so around about 14 authorities where there's a community energy group, but also where um, clusters are engaged, where they've got engaged parish communities that, that are interested in you know, climate action. And, and sure enough, we see there's about 14 areas that this could happen in, in this clustered approach. Um, so just to go back this, you know, what the full sort of community power program is very detailed and it, it takes a lot of resource and time and effort and you've got to bring in lots of partners. So we're thinking about in this cluster approach, a first steps approach for parishes to work with existing community energy groups or evolving community energy groups to widen their reach. And in doing so, sort of offer them a, a shorter version where they start to understand the carbon and energy use of the community. An overview of what properties there are, the different archetypes, you know, um, different villages have different archetypes of properties and they all react differently. Um, scoping and looking at local heat and energy suppliers and bringing them to the village and looking at the supply chain exploring community transport, but also EVs and the, the interest for a community to transition to EVs and the speed that they would do that, say up to 2030, and just measuring the interest for them from the village to transition and developing an, an engagement program to go along it. So, you know, questionnaire for the community, um, outreach events, um, energy assessments of homes and things like that and then a feedback approach. So the, each of those communities would then really receive their own decarbonisation plan and own it so they could take it forward. Um, so just looking at funding options in that, and it's all sort of, you know, what's out there at the moment. There's an Ofgem DNO funding around CIF, you know, the NIA, UKRI, the um, innovation. There's private sector funding, you know, in the retrofit market, more and more um, private sector organisations, we're finding are starting to look at the retrofit solutions and how they can empower and work with communities. Um, UK Infrastructure Bank is looking, starting to build up and work with local authorities and solutions that work alongside the local authorities' net zero strategies. Um, there's devolution that's happening, you know, with shared prosperity and which kind of aligns with this whole piece of work, you know, that um, Chipping were talking about and in Rossendale as well. And um, sort of regional energy funds as well, you know, from um, the, the need to replace the RCEF project, let's face it, so that organisations can do feasibility studies um, and and have these decarbonisation plans. Um, so yeah, that that's community power and community heat. Um, I'll try and answer any questions, or we can all together, Liz. Um, we've actually put on the website down here um, a link. So if you are interested with parishes, express an interest, and you know we'll keep you in the loop and give you information as we go along and see if we can help you. And um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ollie. That was great. Uh, there we go, Keith. You get to go first. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I guess um, there's an awful lot of stuff came out of the presentation. I mean, first, like, just let me say, I thought all three presentations were fabulous. Um, really good mix. So well done for the present presenters and um, the organisers for tonight. It's been really interesting. 
So thinking about the Rosendale project, um, really interested in that. There's a lot of crossover, I think, with the chipping project. Uh, so my first question really was around, um, and I'm not quite sure how far you're on with this, but it's the what I would call the bundling of the service. Um, so we saw um, you know, the sort of fundamental service being boreholes providing ambient heat to houses, but there was talk also of retrofit insulation and I guess retrofit radiating surfaces too. Um, I'm just curious to see what your ideas are on bundling that. Uh, you know, will it be a separate set of services provided to householders or do you think it will be bundled together in one offering? From the perspective of the householder, uh, it'll be a single offering. Okay. That's important, I think, to package that up and um, get buying at a community level across the community for that solution. Um, so clearly the, the benefits case needs to be presented in the right way to the community for that. The underpinning work that we've done already is to, first of all, just to sort of explain the journey quickly, we started with the problem that these communities can't take normal sort of air source heat pump solutions, et cetera. So we've got to find a way around that. So we, we went naturally to the sort of ambient loop and clustered heat solution. We did look at higher temperature systems, energy centers, um, as well as part of that, but there's space constraints, particularly in the urban areas, but also rural as well, making that work. So we went down the ambient cluster um, route, which gives us a lot of benefits, but it doesn't stack up by itself. Um, because particularly with the buildings that you're talking about, you've got to get a, a maximum of six kilowatt thermal heat pump to work in those buildings to, to make that system work, which implies a level of, of retrofit and efficiency measures typically in those in those buildings and homes as well. So we needed to look at that. So why we commissioned the, the survey to do that. And then it's about finding that sweet spot between how much you do without being too invasive. <laughs> To then get that solution working now working with kenza they've already um been working with us uh, and others on the finance model where they'll they'll finance that light retrofit as part of their package as well um and then you recover it in a type sort of a two stacked uh standing charge process so one one aspect of the standing charge is over 30 years which pays for the heat infrastructure itself um, and then the other piece is actually a loan repayment effectively um, over the period of time, but it's built into the heat price to pay for that retrofit. So a homeowner can choose to do their own measures or exceed that level, and, and there are choices. But at the minimum, what we're doing is offering a finance-based low-interest package that allows that system to be deployed and that base level of efficiency measures to be put in. And then combining with that is then obviously the, the energy scheme itself, the community energy scheme integrated with that, um, which is all about... Um, driving down the cost of that heat price even lower. So there's a lot of work that you still have to do to squeeze that heat price down. But if you get the right configuration of renewable energy integrated into it, that could be direct on, on the rooftops, but it could also be sleeved in as well from other sources. And we have, in Rosendale's case, an industrial unit over the road, and we've looked at the yield of that and how to sleeve that in to actually reduce the heat price as well. But in a rural context, as Ollie said, you could use small community schemes dotted around and sleeve that in to get the heat prices down as well. So you package that up, but it, there might be multiple parties to deliver it. But from the consumer's perspective, it's a single package offering to make it all work. Thanks, Phil. I, I get that. So, so does that mean that there's sort of different packages for different households or is it one size fits all? There'll be slight, the, the, the offering, the structure of the offering will be the same, but the level of intervention might vary between households, also just giving them options in terms of what they want to do in their home. But there's a huge amount of options for home improvement in general as part of this. So whilst this is a focus on, on energy in this case, you know, for example, in the community engagement sessions that we had um, in, in the local council halls, et cetera, People were coming in and, and saying, well, I'd, lo I'd love to have a heat pump, but I need to fix my roof first. And, you know, there's lots of other issues that people have with their homes that the survey process can identify and help them with as well. And so we were looking at guttering, roof sort of other aspects and saying, well, how can we build in the home advisory service to sort of combine that? So one home might benefit from more measures than another, but the core offering at the, at the base is to make the system work and give them affordable heat ultimately. Good stuff. Phil, uh, I could ask you loads of questions, but I don't want to hog the time. It'd be good to get together. You're only down the road, so maybe we could 
get together fairly soon. We could try, and yeah, yeah, there's obviously a number of people involved with that as well. So there's a good, there's a good little community of us that are trying to make this work, as it were. Yeah, we're very happy to carry on the conversation. And um, and I guess what the project in Chipping doing, and Ollie mentioned this, is producing uh, energy efficiency uh, performance data for archetypes. And obviously in Rosendale, Phil, you're just looking at one um, archetype of housing, I assume because it's just a terrace street, but if that's something these projects are going to produce and that's usable by other people in other communities where the archetype is similar, is that something that you'll produce for the net zero yeah, terrace street? The model itself is actually applicable to pretty much anywhere. It's just that the focus of the archetype in this case is the terrace house because you, in other models, um, you, you have options to put air source heat pumps and compare and contrast that with community heating, etc., and in, in in Barkham with Ollie, we looked at the heat network and the air source heat pumps, and we selected in that case air source heat pumps because the heat network wouldn't stack up in in the terraced house model. We didn't have the option for the heat pumps, so we had to look at driving a different technical solution. But the learning actually coming out of it is applicable anywhere. Yeah. Kate, did you put your hand up. Um, I know. I was just going to add in uh, you know, saying about kind of this quite a community of us um, looking at these types of projects. And certainly, I mean, at Chipping um, and at Rosendale, we're looking at the Green Heat Network Fund. Um, in rural areas, you have to have a minimum of 100 houses sign up. Um, so it's worth noting that it's, it's open till 2025, it's a finite pot. Um, there's, I think it originally it was about 318 million. I've seen some projects coming through, but <clears throat> once it's gone, it's gone. And um, certainly at shipping, um, it's basically you get a, a period of grace from when the shovel goes in the ground to actually delivering the 100 houses. So we are looking at, the, I mean, Paul mentioned the satellite of Cold Vale. So it, we, we're trying to make sure that we have multiple archetypes so we can kind of expand and potentially bring in other hamlets and satellites to make sure that we will get up to 100 um, how households to, to meet that requirement. Okay, thank you very much. I think it was Greg that was lined up to do the next question. And then should we go to David? Saunders has got a question after that. Thanks, um, be a quick one. Um, thanks to uh, Paul, Phil and Ollie for really great presentations. Um, and I wanted to ask a question about the Terrace Street project in Rosendale. But a couple of terrace streets that uh, spring to mind in Petersfield. Um, and we've heard about mini clusters and we've heard about minimum 100 houses uh, to uh, access certain funding. What's the, the, sort of the starting point in terms of numbers of houses in a terrace house solution of the sort that Phil was describing before, before you can make it viable? Thank you. Uh, it, it does vary on, on the area and the the intervention you need. I mean, when we work with Kenza in, in Rosendale, we were typically looking at sort of, uh, a, you know, each individual cluster would be a minimum of 20, 25 homes or something to get the economic model starting to work. And that does vary depending on the intervention you have to have on the street works to make the cluster work. Um, I was quite interested in hearing about the shipping project about how few houses that they're using on, on each cluster. We, we with Kenza, we're balancing off if you're if you once you're committed to the street works in an area you obviously have to incur a certain cost to put the boreholes in and you don't want to keep coming back and doing work so what we do is we would set up the array first and the pipe work first and choose the area that we want to deploy and then we would calculate the number of homes that we need initial connection to so you don't have to get 100 percent of the community on straight away but there's a there's a there's a line in which you need to meet in terms of getting the minimum of homes on there to start to make it stack up. And that was roughly from memory about sort of 20, 25 homes on each of the arrays that we, we were looking at to get that, but it does vary. So it's part of the modeling and evaluation process to look at that cost of street works, uh, length of line, and then number of homes that you'd have to connect to get that tipping point just right as a minimum. Does that answer your question? Excellent. So I think we're going to David, next and then uh george do you both want to ask your questions because i think they're similar and then we'll get them 
answered. Okay, good. Thanks, Helen. Um, yeah, I'm interested. Uh, these, these are all sort of lovely integrated models. Uh, but what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing is mostly homeowner, and I'm wondering if this can work with social housing in such a way that the you're not basically strong arming the, the owner into investing. Whether you can have a community model that that owns the investment that's repaid out of uh, energy charges, preferably on a, on a single bill. Uh, so you know, does this does this work in different ways? How's this been thought through in these models? Is the question. Hi, George. Does that relate to your question? Yes, so mine is also similar. That what sort of price ranges are we talking about? So if you take a typical household that is interested in going to buy into it, what costs are they looking at? I think on the. Um... So shall I go first, guys? And then I think on the local authority model, um, it provides a real anchor point. So when, when we started Community Power and Community Heat, we had to be conscious, conscious that we weren't working with the local authority directly with the social housing. However, they benefited from the behaviour change work that we were doing, you know, the energy advice and the energy champion work. But actually now, because of our work, the local authority has then caught up with it and they've started building digital twins for all their social housing. And in our area, that's, it's, I think there's 2000 homes, social housing homes. And then they've started to look, David, at, the, at their annual maintenance fee for maintaining those homes. And believe it, you know, it's a huge amount, it goes into millions and millions and millions. And actually they're working now, they're considering from what we've learned on the Barkham Community Heat Programme, actually, if they can start using that maintenance fi finance in a slightly different way to look at solutions to bring the cost of electricity down for their homeowners, because they realise there'll be more social benefits on that. So it's it started the story, if you like. Um, and then um, George, We've done a study in Hampshire of private sector homes and they with retrofit works, you know, for the whole market, for the whole of the, the county council region. And it was averaging out about £30,000 per home that they, they marked it on. It's about £16 billion of retrofit in total. But that study made it very interesting for not only the local authority but all the supply chains to go wow this is our market you know you know this is something we need to stimulate so yeah but it was based on about thirty thousand. i think i'm sure phil and um the guys at chipping may have a different view on that robin from the lancashire county councils here and he's offered to comment on together housing strategies who own some of the housing stock in Rosendale, so for, and they're a housing, um, a social housing provider. So, thank you for your offer, Robin. If you want to unmute to make a, yep, um, got a bit of a cow lick there. That's unfortunate. There we go. <laughs> um, so yeah, I I actually used to work at Together Housing, so um, I don't think they've changed that much in the last couple of years. So I'll I'll just kind of um, throw in kind of a little bit of their strategy on, on a couple of things. So uh, I, I worked primarily on the solar and battery work. So um, Helen's aware of that. So so we, we did a pilot of 250 properties in, in sort of um, Col Colne and Nelson area. Um, so, so they were very much trying to kind of fit in with the, basically that was providing a financial model that they could roll out across all their properties. So they're quite forward thinking on that and trying to fit in with the grid, trying to sort of use demand side response that that sort of thing um and when it comes to uh the heat side of things uh they do have uh, a number of installations of ground source heat um sort of tower blocks at daisy daisy fields in blackburn which uh some of chipping community energy have, have visited um i believe so when when they have a a cluster of them that they can go out themselves they will do it with ground ground source to make it more more efficient um, but obviously when they've got properties that are pepper potted in different places, that option then doesn't become available to them. So what they then do is, is they go to a air source heat pump. So where they've got 
uh, an opportunity where they can work with others to to sort of make the whole area ground source heat pump uh, that's very appealing to them because it means that that then the the tenant can presumably get a a lower bill and, and the the idea is that although although it's not really in in sort of insulation and things like that aren't necessarily in in their favor that they, they are going to get them up to a minimum standard so they're going to retrofit to c as a minimum um, a for new builds that, that's their strategy going forward but the um the the the, the point behind the 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 sort of spending the extra on, on the ground source is to be able to sort of not have to spend it on sort of grid upgrades um and you know so that so that it, essentially it doesn't go down sort of if loads of air source heat pumps having to work harder in really cold temperatures um so yeah th there is there is a benefit for social landlords in sort of providing a lower heat cost to tenants and and or pro providing it as a service which which they're really keen on heat as a service one one of sort of the things that kens are trying to do um and yeah, if the tenant spends less money on their energy, in theory they have more money to spend on their actual um their actual rent. So so that that's the idea behind it. So that they're trying to in, in sort of incentivize it from multiple angles to save the tenant money so they're able to then better pay their rent. We're certainly aware that housing associations are driving the heat pump market in the northwest where well, we're getting the majority of our connection applications from so Kate did you want to add in to this before we go back to the list of questions I, I'm just going to add in about the projects in Stibians um which again that's a Kenza-led project and something we've been really following closely at Chipping um so Kenza managed to get ERDS funding for that project so it does obviously slightly skew um in terms of what we're trying to deliver and subsequently other communities will try to deliver without that type of funding but certainly they gave that they are looking at a whole community so they're looking at uh, social um, social landlord and also private ownership. It's also they're looking at a new build site. Um, so going back to what uh, Phil was saying, um, basically they've, they've put the infrastructure in, but then they've been charging different standing charges for different types of tenure. So for the new build, I think they said their standing charge was only going to be £100 a year. Um, but that was because the developer was putting in some of the costs for things like the heat pumps themselves and, and the internal works. Um, the social landlord tenants were paying £150 standing charge a year, um, but social landlord was collecting that money on behalf of Kenza, so they didn't have an administration cost. But then uh, private owned tenants were going to be paying £300 or £350 standing charge a year to actually connect the infrastructure. On that particular project, they weren't, were, they weren't requiring any retrofit upgrades. They were, they were informing households that they really should think about doing um, energy efficiency. Um, but the only requirement was make sure you've got 300 mils of, of loft insulation in your roof. Um, however, certainly with the project at, at Rosendale, as, as Phil's already said, a big part of our equation is how do you bring down the overall energy consumption far enough to make sure that the annual energy spend for any householder will not go up and practically could go down, even with the inclusion of the standing charge. So working out what that standing charge is going to be on the debt of the infrastructure it is really kind of key. And, and there's lots of different um, variations on that. I, I think Pete put in there around chipping 25,000 um, 25, per household for that infrastructure cost and, and that seems to be fairly general as well so yeah thank, thanks Helen. That's all right what is I mean if, if most people the speakers have mentioned it tonight because what is definitely true is that for these to work they need to involve all the different types of housing tenure to make sure that nobody does get left behind just because of um, where they are living and, uh, and where they are with their life at the moment. Just going to move on to a couple of um, technical, more technical questions now. I think Spencer's got an outstanding question from the beginning of the session about boreholes. And then Ian, do you want to ask your question about the energy um, centre? Is um, Spencer still with us to ask his question? Uh, possibly not. Ian, do you want to go for your yeah, question? Yeah, just um, really thinking about space constraints how what sort of footprint were you looking at particularly in the um the terrace street area for the actual energy center itself 
because you're going to be constrained in that urban area. Yeah, I mean, the, the Kenza sort of systems hardly anything because you the ground source heat pumps are in the, the homes and in the buildings. They can be outside. In our case, they're inside and smaller, what they call the shoebox units, which are up to six kilowatts. You could put a unit outside if you've got the space, a larger unit. Um, and then you've got small, uh, like a, a, a like pump and management station, which is about the size of a small transformer housing that you see on the streets anyway to do that. So, what's your by eight type housing? Yeah. So, um, we in Rosendale, we compared that to an energy center in a traditional sort of fourth generation type system uh, with a large air source heat pump and backup boiler. Um, in 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 Bacup's case in, in Rosendale, there is actually a site where you can put that. So there are, uh, you know, there is an option there. But in many site constrained site, you know, space constrained sites, that just wouldn't be an option. So the the alternative is the ambient loop and then just finding space for that that small unit to go in on the street somewhere. Thanks, Bill. Can I just add on that because I was up in Rosendale with Phil when we scoped the area. I think that was one of the helpful points that there was a kind of her, um, area where we could locate, you know, the energy center. Wasn't that right, Phil? And, you know, when you're scoping an area, you have to consider that. It gave us the option to appraise it. Um, and we and technically, actually, it was a, a good solution in, in many respects to put the energy center there in a higher temperature system because... Um, uh, it negates the need to do so much on the fabric side of things to to make the system work, um, but it's still we're still struggling to make it stack up commercially with an ESCO model, a traditional commercial ESCO model in terms of the level of heat sales and uh, um, trying to work that out because you really need a very large system to get that sort of heat system commercially viable. By the time you sunk the, the street work costs in and the pipe work etc., getting your average commercial ESCO to pick it up. It's quite hard work. So uh, the, the ambient loop combined with the community energy is, is a nicer model to deploy at scale. And also we have to be conscious and, uh, you know, in terms of even in Rosendale, there's only certain areas where you can put that type of heat system at scale, unless you're taking the whole town with you. Um, whilst the ambient loop clusters you can put and start to build up cluster by cluster, you don't have to deliver the whole sort of town in one go and try and make it work commercially in that respect. So. That's why we've we've selected the, the cluster approach for that reason. Uh, thank you very much. I think there's a couple of just outstanding questions which are around sort of how to share information. So I think Nicola's asked about whether other people can use some of these methods and findings to bid into the green heat network. And Gary, you've got a question. I don't know if you want to say it yourself around data sharing. And then I don't know if anyone's got any suggestions about how to sort of keep in touch and keep keep this network going. So Gary, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Yeah, it, it, there's some, you know, really interesting stuff being spoken about on the uh, on, on, on the uh, on the screen today. And um, it, it's clear that there are some parts of the country that are further ahead than others. And uh, I'm part of the part of the chipping group. And um, rather than sort of reinventing the wheel, you know, in every single part of the country, because we're going to have to get to grips with this in some way, um, rather than reinventing the wheel, is there a way in which perhaps something could be put forwards nationally that facilitates um, data sharing, um, strategy formulation, the sort of thought processes that have been gone through in other parts of the country that were, you know, and obviously people have, Perhaps you know, it's taken years to do something. And they said, well, if we'd avoided that mistake, it might have only taken us you know, half the time. So um, find ways of um, being able to share that knowledge, strategy formulation, policy formulation, and, and some of the data points. You know, I, I think I heard um, one of the presenters today say that I think did they say the retrofitting cost between six and eight thousand pounds and there's a sort of sweet spot for the finances and such like I didn't quite understand what was being said but then um, um, someone just said it you know in Hampshire it was going to cost thirty thousand pounds to retrofit um, um, 
um, individual houses. So um, trying to sort of understand, you know, what is the right sort of figure for your sort of housing archetype and sharing that data and that knowledge, you know, perhaps having some sort of repository somewhere that enables um, data um, and, and, you know, to, 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 to be deposited um, might be something we could look to, to create. Um, well, my experience in the community energy sector is everybody's very willing to share. It's just a question of knowing where to find the data and who to talk to. So um, I'm uh, on the board of Community Energy England, and I would encourage everyone to join that as an organisation for uh, sharing and networking. And they have a practitioners uh, group using a function called Lumia, which I don't know a lot about because I don't use it because I'm not a community energy group member. And I think it's very much for people working in the sector but i don't know if anyone else has got any case i don't know if you've got any other suggestions for people to getting together the other thing is we will continue to organize networking events especially those focused across the north um, i just put in the chat helen that um we we have set up a low carbon community heat working group um stroke forum um so community energy england in the process of taking the english side on um we have Community Energy uh, Wales, who are leading on the Welsh side, and Community Energy Scotland on the Scottish side. And then every quarter we have um, a, a, an all nations meet. Um, with, basically with that in mind, to find out who's doing what where, how we can share that learning. Um, and we did say um, on the meeting the other day with Community Energy England, that we're also going to have a bit, a bit of a um, subsidiary group around engagement tools. So for example, Sarah Walter, what other portals are out there? So <clears throat> Duncan from Community Energy England is, is hopefully going to be leading on that. I've got it, got it ticking over for the, for the time being. But if you want to drop me your email, <clears throat> excuse me, I can add you to the, the working group. Um, it's it's very informal at this stage. It's just literally all just keeping in touch and trying to sort notes as best we can. So Kate's emails in the chat. I'm sure Liz, will you email everybody? Yeah, afters as well with that uh and then yeah if you want to join that group just let kate know um uh, okay, yeah. I, do I also recommend the lumio boards there's always lots of very lively chats and people ask for information and get given a lot of feedback from more experienced practitioners and if you're an individual or a group that doesn't have a turnover it doesn't cost anything to join community in england in the first instance you only start paying once you've got some money um, so I think we might have asked anybody's questions. Feel free to don't bother raising your hand, but shouting now if we've missed you, <laughs> shout up if we've missed your question. But I think uh, we've asked answered everyone's questions for tonight. Appreciate that this conversation is just the start of the conversation. Um, I want to say thank you to the speakers. Three uh, excellent presentations uh, taking us through exactly um, Mm -hmm. what you're doing in your communities all the challenges and all the solutions that we can come up with um brilliant questions from everybody um like i said this is just the beginning do join that those networking groups keep in touch um we will continue to plan engagement events um my remit is obviously to work in the northwest but anybody is always welcome to join our events especially when they're webinars and we've all got stuff to, to share and to learn from to each other. So it's for everybody's benefits to come along um, to these events. I was just about to say, Liz, would anybody else like to say anything before? Just want to say in our next webinar, which is, I think it's Thursday, Thursday morning, I think it's the first Thursday, I think it's Thursday, the 2nd of March, is about community bonds and the Shared Prosperity Fund. So I hope that will also be helpful for people. So do come and have a listen to that. Okay then, so unless anybody else is going to think to say, uh, five minutes early, I hope that's appreciated at this time of night. Thank you very much for joining us. Lovely to see you all and have a good night.